This is Major Francisco Moreno. And, uh, and we, sir, we are honored to have you tonight to speak to us. Let me go ahead and read this real quick. We'll only take a minute or two. Tonight's presentation is brought to us by Francisco Moreno. It is based upon his knowledge and experience in the battle at Landing Zone X-Ray in the Idrang Valley, Republic of Vietnam, during the Play Q campaign of October and November 1965. Um, if you didn't know, there was a movie made about it called We Were Soldiers. If you've not seen that movie, which was introduced to me by Colonel Mallon, and um, man, that, that is an excellent, excellent movie. Uh, that's the part of the battle, one of the battles that he had been in. He participated in the battle flying uh, co-pilot with Captain Ed Freeman, a recipient of the Medal of Honor for his part in this action. There were only two. The other one is actually in a display case in the back of the room, I think is where I put it, Bruce Crandall, who retired as a full colonel. Allow me to share Major Marino's biography with you to establish his credentials. Major Marino retired from the U.S. Army after 24 years of active military service. He is a native of Arizona. He graduated from Wilcox, that's the reason why you guys haven't really heard of him, oh, high do. school, <laughs> and soon after joined the U.S. Army at age 17. You had to get a waiver for that. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Okay. He served as an enlisted man for nine years uh, and commissioned a warrant officer aviator in 1964. In 1965, as a warrant officer to his unit, uh, the 11th Air Assault Division, which uh, was a test division. I think it's the first time that had ever been formed up. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Was redesignated the 1st Cavalry Division Air Mobile and moved to South Vietnam. As a member of the 1st Cav Division 229th Assault uh, Helicopter Battalion, he received a battlefield commission to 2nd Lieutenant in uh, 1966. Major Moreno participated in several notable engagements following the Battle of Idrang Valley. In May 1966, he was wounded while conducting medical evacuations of wounded infantrymen. An action that earned him a second distinguished flying cross and the Purple Heart. His wounds were not serious and he returned to flying duties the following day. The next month, June, his helicopter was down by enemy fire in the conduct of a combat assault. Now this is interesting, because I don't know that I would do this, but you did this. The crash site would accommodate only one helicopter at the time, and when his aircraft crashed, no others could land with reinforcements. Consequently, he and his crew remained overnight with the remnants of a Vietnamese army platoon that had been battered earlier. The following day, he and his crew were recovered, as was the helicopter. That is just straight brave. You didn't write that, I <laughs> Major Moreno returned to the United States in 1966 to join a unit that was formed up to ship to Vietnam. He served as a platoon leader and armed helicopter team leader with Troop B, 3rd Squadron, 17th Cavalry on his second tour, returning in late 1968. The following, following his second Vietnam tour, Major Moreno, then captain, attended Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Dayton Beach, Florida. They also have a school up in Prescott, uh, too. Is that Dayton or Daytona? I'm sorry, Daytona. Mm -hmm. Daytona, Florida. Earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Aviation Management. He then went on to serve in a number of combat and staff assignments in armored units in Europe and in the United States. Following retirement, he earned a graduate degree in 1985 graduating from Mississippi College with an MBA. His second career was in uh, nuclear quality assurance and audits organizations of Arizona Public Service Company. Must have been Palo Verde. It was. In addition to the Silver Star, Major Marino's decorations include the Distinguished Flying Cross, the Purple Heart, the Bronze Star, the Air Medal, 42 awards for the Air Medal, is that correct? Senior Army Aviator Badge and Parachute Badge and several commendations, campaign, and service awards. Major Moreno has four grown children and nine grandchildren. He resides with his wife, 
in the Valley of the Sun. His wife is right over here. Each award of the Air Medal constitutes 25 hours of combat assault time. So here's a gentleman that has seen quite a bit. I do want you to tell one quick story before we get started. And you told me this over the phone. And it was, you know, none of us are trained for this. I mean, yeah, you can do training and stuff, but when somebody actually is shooting at you, and I mean, you can see their pupils and they're right up in front of you, the reaction sometimes is a little different than you think it will be, regardless of training. And what was that incident? Oh, that was uh, the one in front of the helicopter. From the helicopter. Uh, my first landing, when I first came under fire in the LZ X-ray, I had a, a North Vietnamese soldier stood up out of the elephant grass and fired directly at our, our windshield and hit the helicopter and pieces were flying off and we had, uh, we were wearing helmets, we had shields of course and that protected us and we had a chest plate we could wear. But with the pieces falling off the helicopter and we're watching these green tracers going all over the place. Um, our gunners were shooting, we had mortar fire going around, and it, it's like um, um, life stands still at that moment. And I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, why is this guy shooting at me? What have I done to him? And it, it took me uh, just that much time to realize this guy is trained to kill and he's trying to kill me. But it, it's something that passes through your mind so fast, and it, it's it's gone just like that. But I've gone back and reflected on that, and uh, it wasn't hard to answer, I'll tell you. <laughs> Frank, for George. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, brother. Great introduction. All of it's true, but... <laughs> um, I'm going to go through this thing. I've got 50 slides, so I'm going to go through it pretty fast. Uh, I'll open it up at the end. We can have a discussion if you wish. And uh, if you wish to ooh and ah, you can do that whenever you want. <laughs> okay. Just keep that close to you. I've been asked to speak to the battles in the Ayadrang primarily because someone recognized somewhere along the line they heard that I had a silver star and asked me if I was a part of it. They uh, found out it was connected to that uh, movie. Uh, we Were Soldiers Once, in a book written by Hal Moore, who was the commanding officer in LZ X-Ray on uh, 14 uh, through 17, um, well, um, during, during the days of the battle, let's put it that way. What I want to show you here first is the map of South Vietnam. And the reason I put it there is just to put perspective on it. During the time when we arrived in Vietnam, we were looking at, and my eyes are not all that good, so I may have to cheat a little bit to get up here. The middle of Vietnam was cut up by Highway 19 that went from Pleiku on the coast, I'm sorry, from Quignon on the coast here, all the way across and into Cambodia. In 1965, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese were getting very brazen, and they could see where they could split Vietnam in half. And so this is where the situation developed, where the United States decided to send forces and, and stop that. Let me take you back, though, to give you a little history on how we came about into the uh, air assault business. Air assault was born of necessity for the armed forces. In 1956, the Air Force Chief of Staff attended the air show in Moscow, in Russia. Not Moscow, United States, but Moscow, Russia. And while sitting there, uh, after the show, when all the high-performance aircraft had gone through their drills, the crowd sat there, mesmerized as the Russians brought in a flight of helicopters, flying blade to blade, almost touching. A massive formation, landing right in front of the stands where the crowd was sitting, 
and the landed and disgorged infantry. They disgorged vehicles. They disgorged artillery pieces. And then the helicopters leave and left the formation there. These guys hooked up the towed artillery to the vehicles. The troops got on the trucks. The fuel trucks pursued them, ammunition trucks following, and they entered into a, a combat formation. And the chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, Nathan Twining at the time, was mesmerized by this thing, and he decided he, we needed to do something ourselves because he was looking at a new concept on air mobility. Up to that point, we had been tied up in Europe by the Russians because of the nuclear race. And our uh, stance at the time was that we were forming up our armored forces to stop Russia and protect Germany and France. So we were really tied to the roads. Tanks don't run on anything but hard roads. And so uh, when Nathan, Twi uh, Nathan Twining came back from um, Moscow and uh, presented this to the uh, other services, they decided that something had to happen. Well, in the meantime, we're also looking at reaching parity with the Russians on uh, nuclear weapons. And we knew that uh, other brush fires were uh, erupting all over the world. Uh, we're looking at uh, Korea was coming about. We had gone through that debacle. debacle. And in 1960, when uh, President Kennedy came into office, he was one of the biggest proponents of uh, developing our forces to deal with insurgencies. And I think most of you veterans will recognize that uh, Kennedy is sometimes uh, referred to as the father of the special forces because he really went out as a proponent of the special forces and he, he wanted to build up those groups in order to introduce them to the insurgency in Vietnam. So he was very receptive to the idea of mobility in the army. Now, inter-service rivalries with the Air Force caused some problems because the Air Force uh, trying to keep possession of their treasure decided that there's no way that anything could be done uh, for the troops that the Air Force couldn't do. Um, however, the, as the argument went back and forth, they, the um, winning argument was that the Air Force could only land in runway, on runways. They had no way after they dropped the troops off, no way that they could support them uh, in, in a combat area. So the Army went ahead with a um, concept of, of uh, moving our forces. As you know, we had in World War II, we had practiced with parachutists, we had practiced with gliders, and all those were costly. Paratroopers, once you put them on the ground, they, they have no mobility. Uh, gliders, we lost a lot of gliders uh, bringing in gear uh, during World War II. So they really had a, a problem to deal with there. So anyway, the idea of the helicopter came into being. And so the question started coming up, are there helicopters out there that can do the job? Can we do the job with helicopters? And so they started looking at what the Army had out there. The Army had been decimated up to this point. They had no, no money, no budget, no nothing. And so Kennedy appointed Robert McNamara as the uh, Secretary of Defense. And immediately, Mr. McNamara uh, appointed uh, Lieutenant General House, Hamilton House, to um, had a board he commissioned to uh, take care of this problem. And so it was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to the United States Army. <clears throat> In 1962, 
they went ahead with the house board and he told him to set up <coughs> let's see, the um, bring in a division and a supporting brigade the mobility brigade and so in 1962 McNamara or I'm sorry in 1962 General Howes uh, recommended that a combat division, assault division, be activated as well as a combat mobility brigade. <clears throat> as an aside, today, as a result of this recommendation by Howes, we have in the United States Army 21 combat aviation brigades. Each one of them has 2,700 men and 120 aircraft. 13 of those combat aviation brigades are active duty. Eight are National Guard. And these are the guys that you see on TV flying around in those uh, Blackhawks. And a heavy lift capability, really just beautiful planes. And they've got uh, a combat aviation brigade is deployed with each division. Army aviation is integrated into the combat arms and can be configured for light combat, heavy combat, or the full spectrum of combat. Moving along, I'd like to give you an introduction. Let's, you came to talk about the battles and that's what I'd like to talk about now. In the Iodran campaign of 23, October 26th, November, the campaign entered three phases. One was the Plamy phase, Chupong phase, and the Iodran phase. LZ X-ray was in the Chupong phase, the second phase. And that took place on 14 through 17 November. This is a map of the area, and I know it's really busy, so I'll, I'll just run through it really quick. Here again, we have Highway 19 going across. Let's see if I can get this thing going. Going across with Pleiku, the city of Pleiku, in this vicinity here. We have LZ X-ray down here. The Chupong Mountain, you're going to see that again. That's a massive mountain that uh, that sat right over LZ X-ray. As we looked up, it's just like a huge cliff. If you were to go up to the Mogollon, where you see the, where you see the Mogollon, you know, just the face of the Mogollon. That's what we saw there. Just a huge cliff. And at night, as we flew in, after the first day, we could fly in from Plamy here. You could see lights, fires, and lanterns all over the place. It, it's just like an ant hill up there. At any rate, let me move on from this map. If you have any questions, we can always come back to it. What we did is we came in, th this place right here, Play Me, was a special forces camp. And they came under attack by the North Vietnamese, laid siege to them, to this camp. The normal process for conducting war in Vietnam was that they would leave their camp here at Play Coup, where the South Vietnamese were, they would normally come down the road to relieve with their force, which was tanks and APCs. And they, every time, no matter where it was, this is the standard way they did it. So all they knew, the North Vietnamese knew that all they had to do was set up an ambush anywhere along this area here. And sure enough, coming in here to play me, they ambushed the North Vietnamese force to where they became ineffective. So. They called for help for Play Me, and this is where the first of the Seventh Cavalry was brought in to play. The historical and military significance of these battles at Landing Zone X ray and Landing Zone Al Albany are important in that the, um, as you can see here, LZ X ray was one of the most significant because it was the first time that we had encountered an enemy force of battalion size or lever, lever or higher. We had never 
been able to pin them down to where we could use our superior firepower. The enemy was reluctant to engage us because, <clears throat> because they had the mass to do it. Large enemy formations were susceptible to the superior and dominant power we had. Artillery, air, and gunships. Here you see this map again. Well, this is this is another map of the battle area. Here again, it's really busy. I put this up here not to confuse you, but to show you this area here in the dark one is South Vietnam. In this area here, you see four spots. If your eyesight is good, mine's not that good, but there are four spots there. One on the coast is Quignon. This is the harbor where we landed when we, we uh, sailed into uh, South Vietnam. An Khe is right there, the next one to the left. And Pleiku, the city of Pleiku, is the one furthest to the left. And down here, the lower white spot is Play Me. And here, this is, they're all played out right here. You see X, the LZ X-ray here. You see Play Me here. I see. LZ X ray. Yeah, play me right here, okay? Like I say, I need help on my eyes, so I'm having a little problem here. I'm focusing on the contrast on this map. This is a better a better diagram here. <clears throat> Note here that LZ X ray is down here. The Chupon Massive is here. LZ Falcon is an interesting place. Play me here. Okay. LZ Falcon is interesting because you will see on my next diagram that we took artillery into LZ Falcon on the morning of the attack. General Moore was told on the 13th of November, be ready to attack in the morning. The division got together, all their experts, and they set up the artillery to where they would fly in by Chinook into this location. They had one company of infantry to defend this area. They set up their batteries, and at 10.17 in the morning, as we took off from Playme, they started their fire suppression on LZ X-ray with the 105 howitzers. <coughs> their flight was into LZ X-ray was at 9.30, 9.30 in the morning. Okay, we can come back to this if you have any questions. This Kateka you see here is a French plantation. In Vietnam, we had French plantations all over the place. And surprisingly enough, surprisingly enough, none of those, none of those plantations were ever touched. They were owned by the French for the most part. But they had beautiful mansions on those uh, um, uh, plantations, and uh, I think they probably paid a pretty good uh, dollar to keep them safe. <clears throat> this is this. Oh God, it's almost like yelling. This is the flight route map of the actual operation. As you can see, Play Me CIDG Camp is here. This big arrow, you, this is an arrow right here, from here all the way down. This is where the 1st of the 7th Cavalry was flown out of the CIDG Camp into LZ X-Ray. This particular thing, two unit designations there, you see, are artillery batteries. As you can see, 21st artillery was flown in to that area at 9.30 in the morning. Other parts of this map show B second of the 5th coming in to reinforce from this position. Now, one of the things that uh, I need to tell you about, there's the 1st of the 7th there. The prime unit 
at LZ X-ray. That was uh, General Hal Moore's unit. I don't know how many uh, are familiar with it, but that was the same unit that um, uh, Custer's unit, Custer's own. And um, this played a real big part into the psyche of our conduct of the mission. For example, uh, you'll see as, as I uh, relate it as we go on here, we flew 14 sorties into LZ X-ray. And years after, people have asked us, how could you guys go knowing that you could lose ships going in there, you could lose people? And actually, uh, the movie did not show a true portrayal of what really happened because it was focused primarily on the infantry. But, uh, and it shows that two people were involved in the air resupply and evacuation of the wounded, and that was Freeman and Crandall. Actually, there were eight people involved, two ships with a crews of four. I was in the ship with Freeman, and I flew the 14 sorties with Freeman. I had a gunner and a crew chief. My gunner and crew chief dismounted the aircraft every time we landed. They got off the aircraft and they went out and they tended to the, the wounded. They dragged them to the aircraft. And for this, these guys got a Bronze Star. That was it. And to show you why that really upset me, it still upsets me, because the UPR reporter that was with Helmore, Joe Galloway, he was uh, the co-writer on his book, he was awarded, as a civilian, a Bronze Star. And when our guys got back and they refused to give them the Medal of Honor, it got downgraded to the Silver Star. And what they said, the Secretary of the Army wrote on there and said, the level of service and the degree of action does not rise to the level of the award requested. So, to me, that was a slap in the face to our guys, and one of them is now deceased. The other one is, uh, is hospitalized in Puerto Rico. And uh, Crandall's, um, Colonel Crandall's uh, co-pilot has since passed away as well. So that's just the personal side of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now the battle itself, I've already mentioned we went through a 30-minute preparatory fires on LZ X-ray. They commenced at 1017, and the way it was coordinated is that as we approached the landing zone, we were looking for a white phosphorus round to be the last round on target. And sure enough, as we cleared the trees, the white phosphorus round was gone off. I mean, we're looking at dust, we're looking at smoke. I mean, the whole battlefield was just completely covered. And so, as our aircraft came in and the rotor wash pushed the stuff aside, we were able to see where we were going to land. And the uh, landing zone uh, would accommodate about four ships at a time. As the battle formed up and the perimeter closed, we were reduced to a landing area for two aircraft. The first four aircraft landed with no enemy contact, or four lifts, I'm sorry, we're talking about four lifts, and we're, uh, we're looking at formations of eight. So we dropped about 250 people at that time. Now we're facing an enemy, as you can see down here, down here, that's outnumbering us four to one. And in some cases, it's been estimated up to seven to one. We're looking at uh, regiments uh, facing 400 American soldiers. Frank, sir, let me just insert one thing. We did not have a great idea of how many we were going to be up against. Is my understanding. Is that, the is exact, that correct? Correct. Yes. Our our uh, intelligence did not give us a good feel for what. Uh, uh, even though we had patrolled extensively, we had uh, first of the Ninth Cavalry, which is a separate cavalry. Uh, squadron, uh, they had been out, they had captured troops along the Cambodian border, and we knew that there were North Vietnamese in there, but we had no idea that we're looking at facing three regiments of North Vietnamese regulars. The other thing is, 
so that those that have not been in service here understand there, there's a distinct difference between the, uh, uh, the North Vietnamese Army, which were hardened troops like these, and then the, the locals. The Viet Cong, yes. Viet Cong. A distinct difference, yes. Uh, we're looking at professionals. The, the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong was armed with uh, rifles and bayonets and that, that's it. The North Vietnamese had mortars, they had um, um, RPGs, heavy and RPGs, and uh, heavy machine guns. And uh, as a consequence, the, the um, Viet Cong uh, tactic was to strike and disappear. The North Vietnamese, as they entered the fray, were in very disciplined formations and they would stand and fight. And they would fight to the death. One uh, an, an anecdote that we talked about a year because we knew that these people came down marching down the Ho Chi Minh Trail along the Cambodian border, where we would not cross over the Cambodian border. We stayed on our side. So they were safe over there, but the anecdote was that they'd get this little guy to pack, um, and they packed their um, mortar rounds, they would split a bamboo bamboo tree and they're hollow so they'd split it and maybe four feet long pieces and they would fit three rounds between the hands and tie them up and then strap them to this guy's back okay and he'd march for three months down to where he was going to join his unit and bring the ammunition and uh, the joke was that as soon as he got down there they unstrapped this thing and they said go back for six more you know and you can imagine what the morale was for these guys. I mean, it was a hard life, no question about it. And they had no shelter like we did. So it was, uh, it was an interesting situation. As the battle intensified, we determined that uh, first of the seventh was in real trouble. And they were. They had gone in with their basic load of, of uh, ammunition, and the, for the infantrymen, that could have been anywhere three to five hundred rounds. So you can imagine, within the first round, these guys had depleted everything, their water, their rations. And so as we got back at the plane meeting after the, after the fourth lift, when we really came under fire, they pulled us back and they said, you go in, so we're just going to hold up and see what happens. But we're monitoring the word, the word on the radio, and we heard these guys, and uh, there, the Colonel uh, Halmore started talking about requiring, requiring resupply of ammunition. He was running short on water, and um, so as uh, our people talked back and forth. Uh, John Mills, who was flying with Crandall, had changed over radios to another ship, and he came to Crandall and said, we really need to go back. And I think there was some discussion about that, and they both agreed that we needed to send a couple of birds back. We never flew more than one bird by itself. So Freeman came into the, the fray, and uh, he told Crandall, he said, you're the commander, you can't go, so let me go. And Crandall says, I got a better idea, we'll all go, the two of us. So uh, Freeman came over to our group as we're standing around and he says, I need a volunteer to go with me into x-ray and we need to get ammunition and water into him. And so then he walked away. And so uh, I walked out of the group and followed him to the bird and he turned around and he says, where are you going? I says, I'm going with you. And then as I looked around, Kumba and Ralph, who were my crew chief and gunner, they said, we're going to. And so he had a full crew ready to go. And you can see, if, if you were to uh, Google, um, let's see, Texas Tech University Vietnam Museum, and you look, just Google the Freeman interview, you will hear him and tell his side of the story it's a lot more polished than, than what I'm giving you here. He was, he's really good. I mean, he gave a good interview to the people from Texas Tech. But it's in the Texas Tech Museum, and you can, you can hear him talk about it. We had two crews from two ships 
Unfortunately, we cannot find any record of who flew with Crandall. Uh, we have names, and we have guys that claim they flew, but, you know, uh, in order to support an award for someone, you, you have to have at least two witnesses. And it's hard to find these guys because a lot of them... Uh, during the Vietnam War, we had a lot of people who were draftees. And those that made it back, when they, their time was up, they got out. And you can't fault them for that. Who are these guys? Well, I've already told you who they were. Okay, the first two sorties, as we went in, disabled our aircraft. And these are not uh, disabilities to our aircraft that we were able to tell. We only found out after we got back. So there was a little hazard in, in going back home, too. And okay, this is important because the medical evacuation was now coming into a re as a requirement because these guys were really taking some hits. And so Medivac came in to the landing zone. They <coughs> were unarmed, totally unarmed. They had no machine guns on board. Um, two ships came in. We, they, we, fed, we led them in. They, one landed and had his windshield blown out. And the second one was hovering to land and had his uh, instrument panel wiped out. So they both aborted and left, and uh, they were not told to come back. So at that point in time, we were also uh, told that uh, we had to affect medical evacuation. So instead of going back and picking up another load of uh, ammunition, we went and landed, picked up the wounded, and started shuttling uh, back to... Uh, play me and to Falcon. Falcon had then moved to hospital and so we were able to take the wounded to uh, Falcon. We flew 14 sorties that day into LZ X-ray. Every trip was 13 minutes there and 13 minutes back. We were flying about 20 kilometers back to play me. <clears throat> On return sorties, we pulled out the wounded. Frank, one other question too. You use more than one helicopter, because some of these helicopters got shot up, is that correct? Yes, yes. We went through four. Yeah. Uh, Serpent, the uh, yellow one was Crandall. That was his, his name is Serpent uh, Yellow Six, but his ship, his platoon was the first platoon, yellow one. Serpent White one was Freeman, and the white platoon belonged to Freeman, four aircraft, and we evacuated 33. Okay, just the review again of what I just mentioned. Now, at, 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 during this time, entire time, the first of the Senate was facing annihilation, and they were looking for ways to resupply at that time. So, it wasn't until about two o'clock in the afternoon that they managed to get uh, uh, troops in the second and fifth to start uh, reinforcing. Okay. Uh, an interesting thing we had, uh, we did hot refueling. Um, what we did is we never shut down our aircraft. Uh, if you shut them down, we would have wasted so much time. It takes uh, time for the aircraft to shut down, first of all, the rotor to stop spinning. Then you have to wait for it to cool down because uh, you cannot start it. You get a hot start uh, if you try to start it because of the temperature of the, the uh, combustion chamber. And so we had to wait until it cooled off, so we just decided we'd uh, refuel hot. Now, and that made it pretty, pretty hard when you had to relieve yourself and that sort of thing, you know, because, uh, so we just, uh, it's a good thing we didn't eat because, you know, all we, all we had to do is uh, uh, take time to uh, uh, relieve ourselves on the, uh, on the drink side. <coughs> We ate as we went along. Our crew chief uh, had always carried a box of sea ration under his seat, 
and when it was time to eat, he would break out the cans of sea rations, and as we were flying along, he did open the can for us, hand it up to the pilot and co-pilot, and that's how we ate. Yellow one uh, had a blade strike in the landing zone, and uh, he had to, we had to change out his uh, uh, aircraft. And like I said, the, the aerial gunner and crew chief both jumped off the aircraft, and they, to their credit, they did a lot in bringing our guys back because they found the, the wounded, and they were able to uh, drag back to the aircraft. And uh, more, they saved more than one. Um, this uh, one aviator that we lost here uh, was shot in the head. That's an interesting. He's an interesting story. He was um, a, a first lieutenant. He took a round through the side of the helmet and it creased his head. And uh, of course, you know, a head wound really bleeds. And uh, so they pulled him out of his aircraft and they hauled him off and we thought we'd lost him for sure. But he was back at the unit the next day. The bullet had only creased his skull and taken the hair off. And years later, and this guy rose to be a brigadier general in artillery. <laughs> But years later, I saw him, and he, he was a redhead, and he had a white hair, a stripe of uh, hair, white hair, along that crease. So he, he had his uh, um, warrior's mark, you know. <laughs> yes. But he turned out, yeah, I saw him in uh, Fort Hood uh, later on, um, in 1975, I think it was, uh, and he was commanding the uh, division artillery for the 1st Cavalry Division there. The casualties that we saw, the landing zone x-ray for Americans, as you can see here, were not good. These guys are memorialized on the wall in Vietnam, I'm sorry, in uh, the Vietnam Wall in Washington, D.C. And uh, they, are, uh, they have their own panels right at where the, where the wall angles, it has a joint on the wall there. I don't remember what, 75 I think, panel 75 I think it is. But um, the enemy forces, you can see a big ratio of kills on our side. And it has a lot to do with the air that we had, uh, air force, the artillery. And um, as you can see here on the bottom, we never really got a good count because they, these guys uh, would drag the bodies from the battlefield to hide their losses. And uh, they would carry, believe it or not, for these battles, they would carry these, uh, you've seen these um, uh, bale, bale hooks, you know, that have a, a cross handle on it, and that's what they use. They just go along and drag a body, pick up a body and drag it. That's how they move them off the battlefield. Landing zone in Albany, is also a negative for us because landing zone Albany, and if you, uh, let me paint it to you this way. If you look at LZ X-ray to be comparable to the area of the uh, Glendale um, arena, okay, that, that would be our perimeter. Um, play coup would probably be, uh, let's see, Upward by carefree is somewhere, okay? <coughs> LZ X ray would be in the vicinity of Buckeye, okay? And so uh, Falcon was uh, about 10 kilometers away uh, to the west, and uh, that's about six miles. And so for a 105 howitzer, and it's no trouble at all to, to drop artillery in, uh, into that area. But 2nd of the 7th was ordered to fly out of, or to move out of uh, LZ X-ray on the morning of the 17th of uh, November because we had a um, b 2 strike coming in on the Chupong Mass. They were, they were going to just obliterate it. And you talk about carpet bombing, you know, this, this is really... Uh, a big operation, and so yeah, these guys are flying at 30,000 feet, the Mi 52s, and dropping tons of bombs. And so their precision wasn't all that good in those days. 
but they did hit their target. At any rate, we didn't want to take a chance on one of our infantry battalions being hammered by the B-52s, so 1st uh, of the second, uh, first of the 7th was being flown out of LZ X-ray. We didn't have enough aircraft to fly 2-7 two, two out, so they told them, you march up to Albany, which was four kilometers away. Well, on the way to, uh, to Albany, LZ Albany, 2nd of the 7th did not exercise good discipline. They did not put their flanks out, and they marched in column, one company behind the other, and they were ambushed by a regiment of North Vietnamese and totally decimated. So that's the black, if you look uh, up LZ Albany, uh, you Google it, uh, Colonel McDade uh, was uh, relieved for that. Uh, a lot of things happened as a result of 2nd of 7th uh, being uh, wiped out. And then it's what they call a meeting engagement. So they lost 151 dead, 2nd and 7th. And when you run into a battle, you can usually count that your wounded casualties are probably going to be four times you're dead. So they lost a lot of folks. <clears throat> now, moving through my slides, I want to tell you a little bit of something on myself here. Um, I enlisted in the Army in 1956. I joined the 101st Airborne Division uh, Paratroopers in uh, 1950, right after uh, out of basic. Uh, I served with them. Uh, for three years I re-enlisted and I went into air defense artillery in 59 where I was shipped to Germany. I was selected for flight school in 1963 and in 1964 <clears throat> I graduated and I went into the 11th Air Assault Division. Okay, for, uh, for my first part of the training was at Fort Benning. And this, this is really what the division was doing at the time. The division, uh, uh, we, we went into uh, Fort Benning, and they gave us the entire base to train on. Now, Fort Benning is a big, big post. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's got a lot of area. Well, we uh, did day and night flying there to begin with, fresh out of flight school. That's our basic orientation of flying. However, we soon outgrew it because we're looking at a division that was now acquiring up to 420 aircraft. That's what we shipped off to Vietnam with, 420 aircraft. And so they went and contracted properties in South and North Carolina where we flew Nap of the Earth flight. And this is, Nap of the Earth is known uh, as flying at treetop level. We did uh, flying by pilotage, estimating time distance, and uh, we followed the contour of the map on a 1 to 25,000 uh, map and that's how we got from one place to another and our guys really got good at it toward the point where they, if they, they could announce within 10 seconds when we were going to land, hit an LZ and land. And so our guys needed to start, you get that formation of 20 aircraft, you start decelerating early in order to make it into the landing zone. We learned formation flight. And we talk about flying at night with blades overlapping. And it was a technique that no one had tried up till then, and no one has tried since then. Dangerous. <laughs> it is. Um, but, you know, at that time we were young, uh, we were 10 feet tall and bulletproof. You know how that goes. So. Air assault maneuvers. Uh, the we, maneuvers took place in uh, the Carolinas. Um, they pitted the 11th Air Assault Division against the 2nd, uh, 82nd Airborne Division and the 11th Air Assault Division outmaneuvered them every time. And so they knew it turned out to be a huge success primarily because we had the helicopters. And uh, in the late 19, or uh, middle of 1965, I uh, was sent to the Dominican Republic as they had that insurrection there. And while there, um, while in the 11th Air Assault, or I'm sorry, the Dominican Republic, we learned uh, 
uh, fly off carriers. Uh, they had uh, the Boxer and the uh, Guam were flying and were uh, sailing in the Caribbean. They uh, allowed us to come in and train, and we learned how to fly off a carrier. These are the units I served with, uh, all elite units that I'm really proud to have served with. The 101st Airborne Division, this is now, the 101st is now our uh, uh, Air Assault Division for the Army. The 11th Air Assault uh, Division uh, here is this is patch for the 11th. And then the cavalry patches, uh, as you well recognize. <clears throat> This is, this is so busy, I'm not even going to mess with it unless someone wants to know something about it, okay? This is the organization of the, the 1st Cavalry Division. It shows the artillery, it shows the infantry, it shows the uh, aviation units, the lift units, and whatnot. But it's getting hot in here, so I think I'm going to move right along. Okay. <laughs> Let me quickly go through what aircraft we took with us when we went. This is one of the most beautiful aircraft you've ever seen, a turboprop... Uh, aircraft by Grumman. They used to fly it in, in Germany and in Korea and along the bottom they, they had a, a looked like a torpedo but it was the side looking radar and what they do is they fly along the border and they were able to map enemy movements and formations across the border. They have a uh, they could mount rockets or bombs on the wing stores and they had machine guns. Well the Air Force being what they are they decided that the Army didn't need that aircraft or this one, and they took them away from us. So, this is the bird that I learned to fly with. This is the basic trainer at Fort Walters, Texas. The Hiller OH-23. Then the first scout helicopter that we developed in the, uh, in the uh, 11th Air Assault Division, and the first cab was the H-13 by Bell. <clears throat> this beast here is my second phase where I started learning to fly cargo helicopters. And uh, this thing uh, had a. Oh gosh. See, I can't multitask. This thing has a reciprocating engine in the nose. And oh, where do you see the orange there? And it, the engine is a dual row nine cylinder engine that came off uh, one of the the bombers okay like the B25 or something like that and what they did is they took it and put it there and tilted it towards the rotor and the shaft goes between the pilot and co-pilot into the transmission and so uh, they were just designing these things around whatever they had available but it worked for a while they used it in Korea for evacuation and some resupply but it just did not have the strength to, to fly and compete in the evolving uh, combat. Here is the Huey as we all know it. <clears throat> this thing was 44 foot blades uh, as it started when we first started it. And we changed it uh, when I got to Vietnam to 48 foot blades. They had to extend the, the tail boom, but it, it, was, it was given a, a, a bigger engine more powerful engine to the point where we were able to lift seven fully loaded combat troops. This model here is, you can see the difference in the size of the cabin on this thing. This was designed more, uh, this is the A model here, but the B and the C models all had the same uh, configuration. They had, of course, they up, uh, beefed up the engines and the rotors. But this is what they use for a gunship. They strap on a uh, mini guns. They put uh, rockets on them and whatnot. This is the armament as as we saw it here. We had the pylon. I need another clicker, don't I? Yeah. Um, this is the pylon for the mini gun that you see here. A nine rocket pod, 2.75 inch rockets, nine of them. And this here is something that's a strange thing that you didn't, we didn't see very often, a 50 caliber machine gun on its own mount here. So that was not manned. How did you turn it then? What? Did the you 50? stick somebody out there to... The 50? Yeah. Yes. Are. See the handles there on yeah, 50? Right. This thing pivots. 
Okay, Th what, this arm here was not solid mounted. It pivoted to where you could pull it. You pulled it into the aircraft. Yes, you could pull it into the aircraft. Now this thing here would pivot, would traverse to where and it would clear the rocket pods. It would clear the cabin for the helicopter, but it would traverse and you could almost fire it straight down or you can swing it on out to shoot the sides. The aircraft, the tilting of the aircraft aimed it. No, no, you had a gunner with a sight. As a matter of fact, uh, it was hanging in front of the pilot's um, station and he could turn that thing around and pivot it off to the side and this would follow. That was the beginning of the, what do they call it, uh, sighting with your helmet. The OH-6, very common aircraft to everyone. This is what we use for scouting. The Loach, yes. Um, wonderful airplane, very hardy. And, and the um, police forces use this a lot. The Cobra, everyone recognizes because of uh, its configuration. It's uh, very narrow. Uh, this was built off the Huey frame, believe it or not. They used essentially, they started out with the same engine. It has a minigun mounted in this uh, XM-18 system here. It has a 38, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 19 rocket uh, pod here on both, on either side, okay? And um, it has a nose minigun and this one traverses 180 degrees to the left or to the right and this one is controlled by the uh, the, the nose uh, minigun is controlled by the gunner in the front seat this XM-18 here is controlled it's a fixed station controlled by the pilot the rockets are controlled by the pilot now there is a way that the gunner if he had to fly the aircraft he would be able to uh, also traverse and uh, you know the Chinook Every veteran is familiar with the Chinook because I'm sure at one time or another you rode in one of these things. But these are the heavy lift. These are the ones that brought in the ammunition. These are the ones that brought in the water, the rations and whatnot in bulk. They carried artillery pieces. These are the guys that brought out the fuel. And the way we transported fuel was in, in uh, bladders. And the bladders were usually, it could be this about this high, made out of rubber. They're round. You could roll them. And uh, they, on either end, they had connectors where you could, the crew chiefs would uh, hook up the pumps and they were able to, to uh, pump the fuel into the aircraft. The Chinook, they would roll these, these pods into the uh, Chinook bladders. They hook them down and when they got out in the field, they just roll them out the ramp. And it was a really easy way to uh, logistically support the aircraft with fuel. Okay, this is a, a picture of, <coughs> excuse me, of the um, Guam that I was telling you about, the flat top in the Caribbean where we learned to fly off a carrier. This is the uh, Kula Gulf. The Kula Gulf, uh, very quickly, along with the Croton, these are Liberty ships. These are, you can see the configurations on these things. They were freighters at one time or troop transports, and they put a platform on them to be able to haul equipment or aircraft. And so it was very, very handy for them to use these things, put them into service, and this, this particular ship is the one that uh, I rode to in Vietnam, uh, to Vietnam on my first tour. Here's another picture of it, uh, that miserable thing. I mean, it was, the only air we got was through the portholes. They had no air conditioning on that thing. Don't say very many portholes. No, and not many portholes, you're right. And there is no thing that's called officer country there. It was all, all ranks in the same place. Now this one is the, the boxer, and the boxer was, uh, you can see here, or I can see it anyway. Yeah, trucks and aircraft. Yeah, see the aircraft in there, uh, cocoons here. And there were a lot, of, lot more of them on the, uh, in the elevators under the uh, in the cargo hold. So 
This thing here hauled off uh, 204 helicopters, I think it was, and the bulk of the division troops. So we had the Kula Gulf and the Croton and the Boxer that, uh, aside from the uh, people that were flown by air into Vietnam for our division, uh, we're talking about uh, 16, 17,000 people. Now, this is uh, a picture I put up there to show you. Um, Freeman there, the Medal of Honor winner. Ralph, my crew chief. Kumba, my gunner. And this is me. Uh, in, in closing out here, mostly the 1st Cavalry Division, we established a new paradigm in that we, we showed that you could uh, have the air mobility you needed in order to accomplish the mission. And we, serve, we also proved that the helicopter could survive in a medium intensity uh, battle environment. This picture here I put in for a particular reason. Uh, in case you don't recognize this guy, this is me right here. Um, this is the landing zone called the Landing Zone Monkey, where um, I was shot down. And this is the day after when Freeman and Crandall flying this bird came in to pick me up. And there's a story behind the, uh, the uh, flight by Freeman. And Freeman, Freeman was a Korean War veteran. Um, and he was a much older gentleman, very, very experienced in helicopters. And in June of uh, 1966, he was uh, sent back home. He had survived all that time, so they decided to send him home early. And he went to play coup where the Big Bird came in to pick up the troops. And uh, they had a big runway there. The Air Force uh, worked out of play coup at that time. And so they take all the troops out of Anke, where we were based. They move them to ship them back to the States. So you got in your Class A uniforms and whatnot at Pleiku, and you're, you shipped all your stuff home. And here is Freeman. On the day that uh, I was shot down, Freeman found out about it. And uh, he left Pleiku and came back to Anke. And he came in and... Um, he um, walked into operations and he said, I want a helicopter. And the Crandall, they call Crandall in, and Crandall says, what do you want a helicopter for? What are you doing back here? And he says, Frank's been shot down, I'm here to get him out. And uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, Crandall says, you're not, we can't go in there, you can't land. There's no, the ship that he flew is crashed in there, you can't get it out. You can't get in. He says, well, I don't know about you. He says, if you don't give me a bird, I'm taking one anyway, and I'm going. So Crandall says, well, if you're going to be that way about it, then I'll go with you. And so they did. They came back the following morning. Uh, all night, we were um, we under siege by our own artillery. I mean, we had, uh, they were about um, 10 miles away, I guess. And um, we were hunkered down. And they kept the enemy off of us with artillery, and that's that's a fascinating show to see that artil those artillery rounds hit the top of the trees and whatnot all the way around you. And the, an interesting thing is uh, most people don't stop and think about it. when the artillery stops, and it's two o'clock in the morning. You say, "Oh my God, they forgot about me." <laughs> and uh, um, for those of you who've been out there, you know this. Um, you listen, and then you you hear the artillery fire the cannon fire and within 15 seconds 20 seconds here comes around you can hear whistling in and that was the comforting thing that we can tell about here's just another another review point um i don't know what else i can say about that but uh so that's the extent of my discussion um I'm willing to just let it go now so we can get some fresh air in here. And if you want to sit down, uh, you want to get some water, you want to go to the bathroom, why don't we do that? And then if you have questions, I'll hang around and we can talk, okay? Thank you very much. hands uh, those that have been part of the first half uh, element in this room. One, there's got to be more than one. Mm -hmm. 
No more than one? Okay. Do you have anything that, uh, that any of those units that you worked with when you were in Vietnam? You are listed at the time. You're listed at the time. But I'd like to thank uh, Frank and uh, his people's efforts with uh, the yellow water back. Developing the concept, which my unit, the first that I evolved out of later on in the, Thank you. in the war. So this was all new to them, but because of their efforts, they designed what I feel is like the perfect combat units. Any questions? And mineral water back then, where old Fort Walton was mm -hmm. there is a helicopter at a museum right there on the road in the mineral wells that there's a Huey sitting on, a platform. The uh, crew chief for uh, a Huey in Vietnam. But they have that mounted up there. Wow. And it's been there now for about two years, three years. But that was, it took 10 years to get it there. I'm a member of the Vietnam Helicopter Crew Members Association as an associate, because I was Navy. But, uh, we used to do all kinds of stuff in Texas there. But they have that one set in there for people to go see. Yeah, I, it's interesting you bring that up because unlike other vehicles, because I've got a lot of military vehicles, some I've got a little sketchy history on, but the vast majority not. But with helicopters, there's logbooks, there's all kinds of copious records kept with them. And one of the guys that I invited, he usually can't make it because he's teaching, uh, Dave Barron is his name, and he has a um, reconditioning and refurbishing uh, facility over here at the Glendale Airport. He, um, I told him about Fred Ferguson, who's a Medal of Honor recipient for the Battle of Way, and is still living. We found one of the helicopters he flew in Vietnam, and it's sitting in Georgia on a VFW pole in front of the VFW in Afaretta, Georgia. So. It's amazing what you can find, and I don't know if you've done any of that with any of the choppers that you've flown, Frank. No. But uh, anyhow, it's, it's very interesting. Thanks for bringing that up. Anyone else? If Frank? anyone's anyone's curious and you want to see, uh, there's an air um, air picture, uh, a picture from the air of LZ Monkey. Uh, it's a small picture. I didn't. Uh, want to blow it up because it wasn't related to the LZF trade, but I've got a book here, um, a historian by the name of uh, Slam Marshall um, wrote Battles in the Monsoon, and um, a real good book of a lot of the engagements that were there. He was one of those guys that followed the troops around from uh, one unit to another, and went. he spent a lot of time in the field, but um, when after I was shot down uh, and I came out, uh, General Marshall asked that I be interviewed for this thing, and he was good enough to mention me in the book. So, but the book, the picture is here in case anyone's interested to see what it looked like. Well, Frank, we have something special for you. And I don't know if you have to add any glasses to work on this or not, but this is the, it's to Frank Marino, January 14th, Desert Warriors, and uh, the Frank Luke uh, Museum. And, we want to give this as a token of our appreciation for your efforts, not only for the part of history that you were a part of, but coming tonight and sharing this with us. And I think this is kind of the first time you've gone to this kind of depth. This is the first time I've ever made this presentation. So this is very important.